everybody, and welcome to another ha HackerCast brought to you by White Hat Security. My name is Jeremiah Grossman, and I am the founder of White Hat Security. And as always, I'm here with Robert Arsenic Hansen out of, out, of, out of Houston. Um, Austin. Our, oh, Austin, that's right. You weren't, you, weren't, you weren't in the storm in Houston. I have Houston on the brain. Everybody <laughs> was everybody was underwater. <laughs> right, that's right. And uh, this is the show where we talk about all the current events going on in application security, try to make things easy, you know, bubble up the stuff that's most important in web security so everybody kind of get a taste of what's going on out there. And uh, to kick things started, there is, well, the name of the story is an exploit kit dedicated to CRF. Now, there's something special about this one and special and uh, from Robert and I's perspective since this goes back to some early research that we did. But uh, I'll let Robert explain what's going on here. Yeah, so apparently there's a, somebody out there um, who's decided to take all of this existing research uh, in different ways to use uh, internet port hacking or port scanning or whatever um, using cross request forgery uh, to break into and modify uh, the, the routers, um, your, your Soho router or whatever, router firewall. Uh, so you go to a website uh, and it tells your browser to connect back to RFC 1918 internal address space. Uh, and it, try, it has like four or five different passwords it'll try, uh, and then it'll try to change your router so that you are now sending uh, DNS stuff through them or routing through them, you know, or, and it's got, I don't know, 13 or so, something like that, uh, different routers that it's mapped out, like Belkin routers or whatever. Um, and, uh, and yeah, this thing's in the wild. This is actually being used. Uh, I think this might be the very first time I've actually seen the code, and it's actually pretty sophisticated. I was surprised. Uh, it actually does a pretty good job. Um, so Jerry and I, you know, we've done a lot of this research in the past, but it's kind of neat to see it actually in the wild, you know, being used by bad guys. Yeah, I think the first time we did this research was back in 2006 at Black Hat, where we said, look, we're going to run our browser into this malicious web page. It's going to leverage your browser, and it's going to change the password on the internal interface on your router. And you should have seen the rubber of the Black Hat audience. They're like, <laughs> uh oh! I, I, like everything that we knew about firewalls and network design just kind of went out the window. There are no more firewalls. As long as we have browsers, there are no firewalls. And everybody's like, "Oh my god, I got to go home and change the password on my router now." <laughs> and, and you know, it's funny. You know, what is this? Like eight years later, the problem still exists. Yes, we know the internal interfaces on routers and everything else with the web interface is insecure. But for some reason, the browser vendors won't fix this stuff. Like, if I'm on the public internet, why does my browser allow me to connect to private IP space? And just like we predicted, the hacks are going to happen, and then they'll fix it. They're going to wait for the bad stuff to happen first. I, I guess that's just the way of things sometimes. Yeah, I uh, had a brief conversation with Giorgio Maone, uh, who's the guy who wrote NoScript. And actually, NoScript has a feature in it called Application Boundary Enforcement, also known as Aid that does actually prevent this. Um, but the problem is a lot of people just can't handle the, the craziness that is uh, no script. It's just too hard for most people. So he's considering creating a standalone plugin specifically to handle this issue since now it is known to be in the wild. Uh, so it, even if you don't want to do the whole craziness that is no script, you'll still be protected. So that's very, that's very smart. My concern is we talked about this earlier was, I mean, when the user loses control over their own network, they're done. I mean, how do you recover a hacked router? How does the how does the average person, you know, patch their router? Even if the patch is available, I mean, we're talking, you know, the home user is screwed. It's gonna, it's tough. Forklift upgrade, just replace it. I was, I ran into this guy uh, a couple weeks ago, and he's like, I, I keep like stuff keeps appearing when I search for things, and it's like, it's not like malware where. It only works on my computer. It also works on my iPad. It's like, how is this happening? And it's like, yeah, your router's own. Uh, you know, I, but so there might be a shift happening. I mean, to speculate a little bit here, maybe it's getting sufficiently hard to hack the endpoint, you know, the iPads and the laptops and all the PCs at home, and now a lot of people are using Macs, that now if you want to hack the user or the home network, you go after the router. Now you don't have to hack the machine. You hack the network. I mean, that seems like the best way, and you get massive lift that way. Yeah, it's, it's actually not just uh, getting harder on the endpoint, but I think it's actually getting easier in some ways on the networking side because so much stuff goes through that network now that maybe you, once upon a time didn't really work that way. So if you do can maintain control over the network, you actually get even better, you know, not just the multiplication effect of having multiple machines that you compromise, but also the stuff that goes through it is more interesting than it used to be. 
I think HTTPS is going to hurt that long term, but you know, there's a lot of stuff that's still over HTTP. But I guess you know, even if there's HTTPS, I mean, you could still man in the middle stuff if you own the router. I mean, you're right, you're right there where you need to be. I guess there might be pinning might help out on some of the major sites, but not everybody uses pinning, not everybody uses CSP, not yet anyway. Um, so maybe the the takeaway for everybody else is, you know, change the password on your router. You know, and we'll start there. Yep. I think part of the problem is people are used to clicking through those error boxes. So even if you do have an SSL warning pop up because you're hitting the wrong SSL certificate, people are just trained, click through. It's, oh, whatever, I need to contact my bank, you know, and yeah. you're done. All right, so that, there's that piece of happy news right there. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got something else called Stegosploit, and the description here is Metasploit, Metasploit in a SVG image. Okay, this sounds crazy cool just as a headline. So Robert, what's the story here? Yeah, so this is a guy named Swati, and I'm gonna totally not pronounce his last name because it's you know 8,000 characters long. Uh, but anyway, he's, uh, he's actually come up with a really cool way that you can embed um, a full, um, like, like a full image of whatever it is that you're interested in inside of, all, I'm sorry, all this code rather, inside of an image. And the weird part is, it doesn't really seem like there's much degradation, like at all. Um, uh, so if you actually watch the video, um, I think it was uh, Samuel Shaw uh, actually did the videos, um, maybe even wrote the paper. Uh, but basically, um, if you look at this, it'll actually be his photo, and and if you zoom way, 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 way in, you can actually make out that there are characters uh, like a D or a Q or whatever, like embedded way, way deep down in the image. So if you're looking at the image, it actually is a valid image. It works. It's fine, just like you'd expect it to be. Uh, and it's a pretty complicated image. You can use any image you want. You don't have to just use his. It's got, it's got to be semi-large, but that's about it. And you can embed this massive amount of code. So uh, if the site has a CSP on it um, and it does allow you to upload images, you can upload this thing and then script source in the image. I know not image source in, but script source in the image. And instead of showing you an image, it'll then run whatever it is. And then in this case, it was a Metasploit um, you know, attack payload for you know, attacking the endpoint, whatever it is. So you're putting Metasploit payloads code in an SVG image to bypass certain security stuff. Right. OK, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I don't even know, like, OK, so who's the victim in this equation here? Like, how do you? Who's the victim? How do you defend against this? Yeah, well, the victim is the website and the, whoever used the website. Um, and the defense is actually pretty straightforward. It's just uh, pre-process the image because if you process it, you know, and, you know, maybe scale it down like a little bit or add a watermark or something like that, it's not going to work. Um, you know, it's it's too sensitive or very very unlikely to work anyway. So that's their recommendation is just pre do another process or filter on it or something like that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good. Uh... That's a good idea. I think Facebook does that basically for all images. Any if, up, image you upload to Facebook, they reprocess no matter what it is. So mm -hmm. everything else gets dropped. That would be malicious. So that's a that's a really good point here. I mean, that's that's a good thing to do anyway. Just um, unless there's some reason you really need it to be like extremely high resolution, you can get away with you know chopping it down because your 640 by 480 is a typical you know old school screen. You probably don't need anything larger than maybe 1024 by whatever. Um, so that might be a good excuse to do that. So anybody who takes ownership over your images like an SVG is basically now your hosting provider for Metasploit modules. Yeah, and the, and the really neat part about this is it totally validates. If you run like uh, like XF data on it, it, it validates. It's it's like a real image. It totally works. Um, so That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> before and after, it looks identical too. Like before processing it with all this stuff and after, it's identical. So that's very cool. So, so this technique, uh, you know, moving to the next story, this technique you said was very similar to the next story we're going to talk about here. It's in the title is using ads to bypass content security policy or CSP for short. So mm -hmm. what is that story and wh what are the similar techniques? Yeah, they call it an XSS polyglot, which is actually kind of, a, kind of an interesting term. Um, but basically it's the identical problem, exactly the same, except instead of it being an image, it's, um, it's a flash file. Uh, so it turns out there's some circumstances where you can find cross-site scripting on websites, 
and the CSP is permissive enough to allow, let's say, something to be hosted on like S3 or something, something else you can compromise. But all you can really get on there is uh, maybe um, uh, some Swift file or whatever, you know, some, some, um, uh, some flash file. So you can source in that flash file with script source equals blah, blah, blah. Oh. And, and then you can bypass it by virtue of it, be, it is a valid Swift file. I mean, so, you know, it's unlike images. It's not very easy to, to reprocess a Swift file, uh, but it will bypass CSP, um, which is pretty so, good. So you leave a little exception for CSP to allow Flash. I get, you know, I actually remember this old quote from back in the day, right? You know, if JavaScript can't do it, you ask Daddy Flash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's basically what's going, going on here. It's... Uh, you know that you make a little exception or, and flash or, Java, right there. or Java. You go. Yeah. Java's still a thing. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, was neat. All right, and uh, our fourth and final story here is uh, the headline. Here is ensure sites lack security uh, in in challenge to cottage health claims. Okay, so it's, it's a very uh, poor title, but. Uh, let me, let me read this here because the players' names get a little confusing here. So there, you know, cybersecurity insurance is a really big and fast growing market these days. Effectively, if everybody thinks they're going to get compromised, and most people do, that the only rational conclusion is, yes, you try to secure your stuff, but you buy cybersecurity insurance. And it's growing really quickly. I talked about this at, uh, at RSA. And, you know, when things get hacked, you put a claim in. So a company called Cottage Health Systems was hacked, and they put it in a claim to their insurer provider, whose name is Columbia Casualty. Here's where it gets interesting, because Columbia Casualty denied the claim. And the reason they denied the claim is, what, here's what they said. I'm going to quote here. Failure, OK, uh, Columbia said of Cottage that they failed to continuously implement the procedures and risk controls identified in its application. Okay, so what does that mean? That means Cottage Health Systems, when they went about and got try to get cybersecurity insurance, you have to fill out this questionnaire, this thing that tells the, the insurer you know, everything that you're doing so they can you know, measure your thresholds, your risks, and your premiums. When it comes back later in the analysis and the, what do you call it, the forensics results that, you know, you know, Columbia was like, uh, you guys didn't follow what you said, what you told us. So how can you ask us to make a claim? So now the insurers are pushing back. But it's the idea that, you know, that you said you're going to do continuous security and you really didn't. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, this, you know, it's the whole thing. Like we got this, uh, we got this policy. It's like, okay, are you following the policy? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, if you're not, then why would they pay out? And I actually kind of agree with them. I mean, uh, I know it sounds bad. I mean, as an insurer, you really want, you know, as an insuree, I suppose, you really want your insurer to to give you your money back, you know, if, if something bad happens. But in this particular case, I kind of want to agree with the insurer. I want to say, like, if you didn't do your, even the bare minimum of what you said you were going to do, why would I insure you? Why, why would I give you your money? Well, it's it's true. I mean, I mean, if, if this situation is true, it's just as they describe it. You know, uh, Columbia, the insurer, said that, okay, we're going to base your risk and your thresholds on what you say you're doing. If it comes to find out later you weren't doing that, how can you expect us to, you know, honor our agreement when you didn't honor yours? Right. Or, you know, the only other way you could do that is, like, retroactively pay the claims, you know, or, or, the, or the premiums or whatever for what, it, what we would have insured you. I mean, what would have been the delta? Like, if, if you're not doing all the things you claim you're doing, then, you know... You got to pay. You got to pay up. I mean, one way or another. So one of the things that was interesting to me as you follow along, not just this story, is that when when companies buy cybersecurity insurance, it's usually the CFOs and the risk officers um, buying it, and the security teams just fill out the questionnaires. Now, what's interesting is that when the questionnaires are filled out, you know, here's the policy, here's the questionnaire. Now, the security guy at the company now gets a very big bat to go like, no, we, we have to do these things we said we did in the questionnaire, otherwise our insurance is no good. That, that's, that's kind of a big lever when you're asking for budget and resources and the, and the company to adhere to its own policies and guidelines. Mm -hmm. You know, now that there's this case that's out there, this example, you actually just, the security teams can actually get, get the business to do what they think is the right thing and follow their own policies, which is, I know, kind of strange. Yeah. 
I mean, it's great if they have one more stick that they can use to to make something happen. I mean, my only concern is are they are those guys the same guys signing and in control of that document, or is that done by a completely different like risk mitigation group or something? Uh, risk risk compliance group that has nothing to do with the guy who's actually in the trenches trying to fix code. You know, those, if they're completely different groups, you know, it's a little, you know, it's hard to use that same stick. Yeah, you have the risk, you have the risk part of the organization, you have the security teams, and then you have like the IT auditors, right? Now, while cybersecurity insurance tends to be bought by the risk team, the vast majority of the time, in my experience, it's always the secure the CISO's job or the security team is to fill out the questionnaire. So IT audit, it serves a different function. I don't think they get involved in cybersecurity insurance yet. It might be completely different, but you know, that might be a good scenario. But I don't think the security, the security teams know that they can actually use this as a lever. You know, like whatever you've put in your insurance document, you really have to follow if you're hoping your if you're thinking your insurance is going to be valid. And that certainly would be a board discussion these days. Is you know, the board might be thinking, okay, great, we have security concerns, everybody does. Uh, but we're insured, great. But if it comes out later that your insurance is not valid because the company isn't following following what's in the what's in the what's in the, the questionnaire, well, that's a really big problem, and the board's going to want to know. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. I mean, it's, it, I think you know we're we're kind of first seeing that these are the first people who've had to gone through this kind of thing, right? and so uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of years as more of these cases sort of pop up. Yeah, it, 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 to that point, it's interesting because I. You know, I've seen very little cases that are out there or news stories about insurers not paying cybersecurity insurance or pushing back. I mean, I have seen plenty of from, you know, Home Depot and Sony and Target that got rather substantial large cyber insurance claim payouts. Um, you know, maybe there was pushback behind the scenes, but it, they certainly didn't say n no. Um, but I imagine as more and more claims as the insurance industry gets bigger, we're going to see more of this stuff. But, you know, everybody's going to have to start following what they say they do. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so that's our, our hacker cast for this week. We covered, we have some tools, we got some hacks, we got some leading edge stuff, and we even got some non-technical cybersecurity insurance stuff. So it's a it's an interesting week out there as always. Yeah. All right, thanks everybody. If you like what we're doing here, please rate, please subscribe. Thank you very much. Take it easy.